Now we're going to start off. Um, Lars, you're going to lead us off, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here, in, in particular because uh, the conference takes place on April 16, and the, there is just now a new direct flight from Copenhagen to San Francisco, which I could enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> My background is the following one. I have worked for 10 years as research advisor in DG ECFIN of the European Commission in Brussels. I worked on the Euro, fiscal policies, the stability and growth pact, business cycles and inflation. In the EU, I worked from the inside. So, what did I, as a Eurocrat, learn from 10 years of policy experience in Brussels? I think there's one lesson. Well, first of all, I have a reply to this question, which I never put in print, and that is, when I came to Brussels, I had no prejudices about Europeans. When I left, I had them all. But I don't put that in print. Uh, instead, I say the same thing. When applying macroeconomic models in an EU context, you should pay careful attention to the economic policy culture of individual member states. And what is the economic policy culture? Well, it's the kind of the policy regime, the broader framework for framing economic policies. And it consists of two key features. First of all, the expectations held by the public, the voters, concerning the behavior of policymakers. And second, the expectations held by the policymakers concerning the behavior of the public, the voters. And these policy expectations, and that's the policy behavior, are influenced by a number of factors. History, religion, culture. I summarize it in this presentation in the concept of trust. And trust is the key to understanding the causes, the evolution, and the cures of the Euro crisis. But how do we measure trust? Well, the Euro is a unique currency. It's a unique currency, first of all, because it's the first time we have a monetary union with centralized monetary policy making and decentralized fiscal policy making. The second unique feature with the euro is that we ha it's the only currency for which long run, regular, and consistent data exists across all member states concerning its popular support. We have no data of this kind for the dollar, or pound, or any other currency. If, if you ask Americans, how do you like the dollar? I mean, they can't understand the question. <laughs> they, they can't answer. If you ask a European, how do you like the euro? You can get a lot of answers. So data also exists not only for supporting the euro, we also have trust, data for trust in European institutions like the ECB, the Commission, the European Parliament, as well as in national political institutions. And this data set covers 20 years. It's huge. It's like one million responses to analyze. It's a goldmine for researchers. The question is, why haven't researchers used it? And that's because they don't have any theories in monetary economics or monetary history where we explicitly bring in concepts like trust or popularity. So, what does the data tell us? I'm first going to present the data and then I'm going to use it to explain the euro crisis. Here we have a set of countries. First, the Northern Group, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. Then we have the UK, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Greece. And the first question is, do you tend to trust or not to trust the government the second question is, do you tend to trust, not to trust political parties? And the final question is, are you satisfied with the work, democracy, the way democracy works in your country? And here you have a striking differences between the North and the South. In Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, you trust the government. You trust the political parties. You are very satisfied with the way democracy works. Look upon Denmark. 90% of the Danish respondents, they like, they are fond of their democracy. Look at Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. It's, you know, the numbers of that are 11, 7, 5. I mean, it's, it's so small. So basically, you have two different cultures covered here with uh, Germany, France, and the UK in between. This is just to bring out the north-south dimension. There's another way to do it, and I do it in this chart. I cover all the EU member countries in November 2012, that is the most, use, the most recent euro barometer we have. And we have the same, we have, I study how the net trust, that is, tend to trust minus those not tend to trust. And here we have the government, the parliament, and the political parties. And you can start with Finland, Sweden, Austria, Luxembourg, and you go down to from plus seven, to plus 27, plus 21, plus 21, and then you go down to Greece, minus 84. Uh, minus 80, minus 89. I mean, is it, I would say, not the total 
distrust in the political system, but I would say it's a very strong distrust. What do we use this kind of observations for when we discuss po uh, policy framework and policy issues? Well, we can look upon the euro crisis and we'll, can ask the question, what, did, what was the direct cause of the euro crisis? Well, the fundamental uh, problem was the conduct of fiscal policies on the member state level. The Stability and Growth Pact was designed to discipline fiscal policy across member states. It failed due to the weak preventive and corrective arm of the Stability and Growth Pact. That's one answer. That's a standard macroeconomic answer. But there's a deeper answer. There's an indirect cause. And the fundamental cause of the crisis is a lack of trust by the public in the political system, in the government and in the national parliament. Lack of trust contributes to tax evasion, to the spread and acceptance of corruption. It contributes to a populistic, short-run economic policy approach, preventing a balanced fiscal policy and structural reforms. It contributes to low quality of governance. That's an outcome. And you can ask, talk about the vicious trust circle. Weak economic performance fosters low trust in the political system, preventing reform and fiscal consolidation, contributing to weak growth, weak tax compliance, capital flight, and so on and the global crisis reduces trust level. And low trust in democracy fosters extreme political reactions. When you listen to Brad along this morning, he was pushing for this line, and I think Harold was also bringing it in, comparing it to, uh, Europe today with Europe in the 1930s. And there's a virtuous trust thought. Strong economic performance fosters strong trust in the political system. It fosters solidarity and trust within society. This is the case of the Nordics and Germany. These countries have carried out reforms and benefited from them. And now they recommend the same approach, the same, I would say, Lutheran approach, to the Catholic Southerners <laughs> who lack solidarity <laughs> with the political systems that are viewed as dishonest, corrupt, subject to clientelism and rancid. And the trust, I have covered just trust presence. The trust during the fall of 2012, during the crisis. And of course, every major economic crisis reduces trust in the political system. But how about the long run picture? And I would just show you two types of trust trust in the EU system, that is, in the European Parliament, ECB, and the European Commission, and trust in national political systems, national government, and the national parliament. And here's the data. And the lowest, it's, you know, I don't have a point. Here it is. This line is trust in the national system. And here's a zero line. And you can see that after the crisis, 2008, uh, the crisis, uh, trust has fallen sharply. Here's trust in EU institutions. And it has also fallen sharply, but it's higher. You trust more Brussels than you trust Rome or Madrid. And finally, this is the most remarkable aspect. This is support for the euro. And the support for the euro has basically remained the same. And this chart covers the EU 12, the original members. Here I have taken just EU 4, Spain, Greece, Portugal, Ireland. And you have to extend the scale downwards to minus 80. And you can see what a dramatic fall in trust in uh, these uh, crisis countries. And the amazing thing is that the popularity of the euro is actually constant. For Greece, there are studies showing that the popularity of the euro increased during the crisis. And this is a riddle, I'll come back to it. Here is a comparison between net trust in the ECB and trust in the euro. This is ECB supplying the currency. This is the currency. And it's an amazing difference. People trust the euro, but they don't trust the institution producing the euro. And some of my Swedish friends tell me, this just shows that the Europeans are schizophrenic. They don't know what's going on. But I think they're not schizophrenic. The euro is the only stable currency in this uh, crisis. So here is a summary. Trust in the national political systems, and the EU has declined, more so in the South. Trust in the EU system is higher than trust in the national political system. Support in the euro remains constant, not affected by the crisis, while trust in ECB has declined. And how do you explain the stable trust in the euro and declining trust in ECB? Well, <coughs> the euro has got a credibility of its own. It's not blamed for the crisis. So it's not a euro crisis. But, uh, and this is, in a way, good news for the euro. Now to the cure. 
I have five minutes to finish. Uh, the official EU response is this one. Strengthen the preventive and corrective arm of the Stability and Growth Pact. Improve the quality of fiscal governance. And you have the program. You have the six pack, the two pack, the fiscal compact, and perhaps a banking union, a budgetary union, a fiscal union, and a political union. And here is a summary of all the measures taken by the Commission and the Council to strengthen the preventive arms of the SGB. And when this, was, this picture was first shown to a group of Finnish economists and policymakers, they just sighed, I mean, look at the mess of all the steps that are going to be taken now in the European semester. So the question is, will this work? Well, the new fiscal framework <coughs> will probably be better than the old one, but it has to strengthen, in my view, the decentralized fiscal policy making, thus strengthening trust in the national political system. Fiscal policy is central in the democratic process, thus it should rest strongly with the member states. If we look upon the long-run cure, the answer is, of course, we should foster trust in the national political system and in the EU system via decentralized fiscal policy. The question is how? Well, there are a number of solutions actually now on the agenda. Fiscal policy councils in every Euro member country, you will see that in a few years. The Eurostat offices should be in every Euro member country, so no country can play around with the data and fool the Commission. We have the annual alert mechanism report being produced now. Second report came out a few weeks ago. And we may also play with explicit expenditures constraints. But this is a lengthy process from judging from history. It takes time to change trust in the political system. And this is not a short-run solution. So, I have two minutes. What about the future of the Euro? Well, so far there is popular support for the Euro. But the question is, how long? It's really exciting. Every new Eurobarometer will give us an answer. When will the blame game be played so it will be actually the currency that is uh, the cause of the crisis? Well, I have a very say, commonsensical reply to this question. It depends on how rapidly EU and domestic policymakers learn how to make the monetary union work better, bringing about a recovery, thus creating the trust necessary to foster euro sustainability. Well, I haven't discussed the issue. How much trust do we need? I mean, what is the level of trust that's critical for the sustainability of the euro? We don't know yet. The future may test that. Suppose the euro is not becoming sustainable. What will happen? Well, perhaps we will get a high-trust monetary union in Northern Europe and a low-trust monetary union in Southern Europe with a flexible exchange rate. And eventually, when trust is equally distributed across the Europe, European Union, the exchange rate can be locked permanently forever. And this idea of having two monetary unions uh, in Europe has been uh, playing around uh, for a long time. Dornbusch proposed it very early, and uh, uh, you can also have this, say, uh, Lutheran Catholic uh, limit uh, to set up the differences between <laughs> Northern and Southern Europe. So, the future of the Euro, my last slide. The EU has evolved through crisis. Now it's hit by the deepest crisis so far. And in a way, this is promising, because they, the crisis is forcing the policymakers to rethinking their approaches. The number of steps we have seen being taken concerning structural reform, for example, is just amazing if you compare it with the first 10 years of the euro. So I will have an optimistic take, and I will take the approach by many of the, the other panelists. What can uh, the US teach Europe? And there is a lesson from the United States for Europe actually expressed by one of Obama's advisors. Don't waste a good crisis. And I hope that the Europeans are not going to waste this good crisis. Eventually, they come to up to with very good solutions and a much stronger euro. So I'm basically optimistic. And this optimism is, of course, not only depending upon my pension, which is paid by the Commission. It's also <laughs> in my belief that the alternatives for Europe, I mean, just imagine what kind of Europe you will have without the euro and without the EU. You can go back to history, you can look upon what our powers that will dominate, be dominating in Europe, what are the patterns you will see if you don't have the EU. You may say that the Euro didn't turn out to be that successful, but consider the alternatives. I think uh, there is, it's, it's a very good choice. Thank you.
Thank you very much. 